Her Royal Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was the second longest reigning monarch in history, for 70 years and 214 days to be exact. Taking the throne on the 6th of February 1952 after the death of her father at only 25 years old, her record is only bested by King Louis XIV of France, who ruled for 72 years. She was the only monarch many Britons ever knew, with three or four generations of families only ever being under her rule, becoming part of normal life, which may explain the strange parasocial relationship between her and her people. Even with times changing and attitudes becoming progressively more anti-monarchy, Elizabeth has mostly remained a liked figure. I want to explain why this cognitive dissonance exists, why there seems to be a rising dislike of the royal family but Elizabeth is loved so much. In order to explore this, I need to explain the history of monarchy dynamics with the people, the Queen's history, and parasocial relationships. This is going to get a little bit confusing because Britain hasn't always been Britain. Britain wasn't officially unified until 1707. As for the monarchy itself, that's also a really long story. Britain hasn't always had a monarchy. Britain began as several nomadic tribes made up of Celtic people. And then 43 AD came along and oh, it's the Romans. They're going to invade and occupy Britain, which isn't Britain at this time. It's just different parts of the same island. This lasted for about 500 years until the year 410 AD when the Romans realized that Britain was in economic decline and they were sick of barbarians, as they described, attacking them all the time. And by barbarians, I think they mean indigenous people who were annoyed that they were there and have absolutely no worries that little ironic fact will come back up in this video after the romans buggered off there were several kingdoms that were formed within britain for example the kingdom of scotland and the kingdom of northumbria sometime around the year 839 the first king of a unified britain was king ethelwolf i'm probably butchering that name the kings of the respective kingdoms within Britain then spent most of their time trying to fend off Vikings who wanted to raid monasteries and steal people to work for them for free. Does that sound familiar to anyone? And then 1066 came around and the Normans decided that they'd have a crack at Britain and William the Conqueror is king. Hundreds of years of shenanigans later where Scotland is now included in Britain and then also Ireland, but then in 1949, most of Ireland is declared a republic and we just have Northern Ireland and we're where we are now. And I had to tell you all of that because the monarchy is not as straightforward as I would hope it would be because Great Britain hasn't always been England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's been not even England. Not even England was a unified country. And then you've got to add all the other kingdoms in there. And, and then they had their own kings and then it was unified. And then somebody else took over that unified line of royalty and so confused. There has been one constant though, Christianity. And it was argued that those who were in charge of the country within the monarchy were ones chosen by God. And somewhere along the line, a guy called Karl Marx had a massive problem with this. In the 1800s, Karl Marx decided to kick off the Communist Manifesto. Thanks, dude. But his takes on class and religion were well, I can't fault him on them. He was pretty straightforward and right about them. He argued that religion was used as a tool to keep the working class quiet and obedient, that they were taught that they are where they are because that's where God wants them to be, that if they work every single day, except Sunday and go to church, then they will end up in heaven where they're supposed to be. They just need to listen to the Bible and listen to those in power, including the monarchy, because they were chosen by God and they'll be right on the money. Not really though, because they're poor. Religion then wasn't as it is now. It wasn't something that you just opted out of. No, it was the truth and the only truth. You have to listen to the monarchy and you have to obey them because if you don't, then you're going to hell. And it's not like a lot of the poorer classes had a lot of choice in the matter. Hey you, yeah you, you're poor, you can't feed your family. I know how you can feed your family and uphold the word of the Lord. Go off to this faraway country, take the locals, round them up, steal all their stuff and teach them Christianity. You're good to go. 
Oh, what's that? You don't feel like colonizing? Treason. And even if you are a well-off citizen or a wealthy lord or lady, you still need to obey. That's the structure of the hierarchy. They're above you. Don't argue with it. The most blatant example of this idea being put into action is probably by Henry VIII, when he declared himself the supreme leader of the Church of England. Thanks to the wonders of science, however, it isn't a societal consensus that Christianity is amazing and the Bible is absolutely right. In 1975, only 22% of Britain stated that religion had no significance on their life or they had no religion. This has vastly increased since. In 2020, 55% of Britons said that they had no religion. It's also important to note that the way we perceive God has similarities to the way that we perceive the monarchy. In the pre-modern era, God was to be feared, taking notes more so from the Old Testament rather than the New. But new religious interpretations may have encouraged a more benevolent view of God. In the same vein, the monarchy was to be feared. This may have changed for many different reasons, one of them being the monarch needed to be feared because it was a time of many different wars and battles and many different invasions. There were sieges across Europe and the world and so it paid to have a leader that your enemies would be scared of. But it's a hard balance to make your enemies scared of you but to have your people love you. Monarchs were encouraged to be merciless and as hard as steel. That was the only way to keep your people safe. Another change may have come from the conception of morality, ethics and human rights. And this had impacts on many different aspects of society, from law and punishment, no longer executing people for stealing loaves of bread, and when it came to government. By the end of the 15th century, Britons had heard of this crazy new concept called democracy, and around this time is when the first features of what would be parliament were formed. But rather than simply abolishing the monarchy, they decided to work alongside this new government. And gradually over time, elected officials would become more and more powerful. And what people voted for would be taken more and more into consideration. Whether or not that's actually true today, I'm sure many British people with me included, would argue that. And the last aspect is media. For centuries, the monarch was simply a person who lived in a palace while you couldn't even get near the walls, if you even lived there. For most of the population, you probably lived in a village far away from any major city and just knew that you had a monarch and that there were laws, but not really much about the monarch themselves. Alongside the revolution of transportation, there was also the freedom of news. Not only could you hop on a train and be somewhere else in a couple of hours, you could also pick up a newspaper and read the latest news. This made the monarchy more accessible than ever, because of course, if your civilians are now running around the country and also have a smartphone, of course they're gonna wanna know about the person who's ruling over them. And we also have information, because of the internet, of past rulers. You can't be that same merciless, feared ruler because they were a tyrant. People are now more informed on their human rights and they're more informed on what they should expect to have a good quality of life. While of course the royal family is still treated with the greatest respect, in comparison to rulers in the medieval period, we're damn right informal with them. I now think it's time to go into a brief history of Queen Elizabeth II. Elizabeth was never supposed to be queen. Her father, Prince Albert, was the younger brother of Prince Edward VIII, who was heir to the throne. However, Edward abdicated because he wanted to marry an American divorcee. Disgusting. That left Albert being the heir apparent and his eldest child, Elizabeth, to be the future Queen of England. She was 10 at this time, 10 years old and told that one day she would be the Queen of Great Britain and the Commonwealth. At 10, I still enjoy dinosaur nuggets. During World War II, at the age of 14, she made her first radio broadcast in 1940. She worked and trained as a driver and a mechanic. 
And with her identity concealed, her and her sister Margaret engaged with those in the crowd celebrating Victory in Europe Day in 1945. This is what cemented her as a beloved queen in the eyes of those that we would know as our grandparents. In the 1980s, media interest in the royals increased, which may explain why our parents liked her so much. And by the time we're now reaching us, the current generation, and perhaps the generation after us, she was commonplace in our lives. We were used to her. She was the queen, our queen. Queen Elizabeth was the first reigning monarch of Australia and New Zealand to visit those countries. She was the first monarch to visit a communist nation, Yugoslavia. And she was the first British monarch to visit China. But now we have to talk about what she represented. In 1997, she and Philip visited the Jallianwala Bagh Memorial in India. In 1919, a peaceful protest ended with an attack from the British Indian Army, killing between 379 to 1500 people. The British Empire was established in the late 16th century and ended in the 18th century. It covered 23% of the globe. Following the lead of Spanish and Portuguese explorers, Britain began sending out their own expeditions to find new land, discovering that was in quotes, new places. The problem being, those places already had people. There's somewhere that you might have heard of that was part of the British Empire. America. The British travelled across the seas and discovered America and claimed it in the name of the king, James. That explains James Town. And it's much like what the Vikings did to the Britons, except the Vikings eventually left. The British just never did. They stuck a flag in the ground and went, yes, this is ours now, because the king told us to, and by proxy, God. And this happened over and over and over again. Countries were taken by the British by force and made into colonies, which eventually would become a commonwealth. Many countries have since gained their independence, but the effects of the British occupation still linger. And while the Queen wasn't alive during colonisation, and she wasn't alive during the Jallianwala Bagh attack, she still reaped the rewards of colonisation, while others still suffer with the effects of it. It's what she represented, and not necessarily her as a person. Although it is really hard to tell what she was like as a person, because the monarch of Britain isn't actually allowed to express an opinion or take any specific side. That's what political parties are for, not the sovereign. So many frustrations with the royal family come alongside the fact that they didn't necessarily earn their title. Although they pledge to serve the country, they're there by mere coincidence, because nowadays it's no longer accepted that they were chosen by God. Not only do they live off of the taxpayers' money, they also have a long history of subjugating other countries. The cognitive dissonance may come from the fact that a lot of people, as I've stated before, feel like they know the Queen because she's been around for so long, and because of the presence that she had throughout their lives. Like I said, our grandparents would think of her during the war, our parents would think of her during media exposure, and we would think of her simply being there and hearing about how great she was from the older generation. And I think this is the time in which we can talk about parasocial relationships, which are one-sided, non-reciprocal relationships. Mokocion et al. developed the Celebrity Attitude Scale in conjunction with Maltby et al.'s research to develop three levels of parasocial relationships. 1. Entertainment Social The least intense level, where celebrities serve only to entertain. 2. Intense Personal A sense of greater personal connection with the celebrity where you feel compelled to learn more about their likes and dislikes and mirror them. 3. Borderline Pathological The most intense level, including fantasies and extreme behaviour. This extreme behaviour may lead to financial investments, such as spending a lot of money to attend a premiere, or illegal behaviour such as stalking. At this level, it is also common for the fan to believe their feelings will be reciprocated where they meet the target of their adoration. I think most people within Britain would probably say that they really don't care about the royal family as a whole. 
the family and the institution. But when it comes to Elizabeth herself, they probably would fit within number one. She's there, that's okay, and I'm not too bothered with it. The loss of the Queen may be sad to them because it's a disruption in normal life. It's a change and any change can be dramatic, especially if you're so used to seeing somebody everywhere and now they're not there anymore. I think when it comes to intense personal, the second type, this may affect the older generation more. They feel they have a shared experience with her being young people during the war. I'm sure the third type exists. There was that recent case of somebody trying to break into Buckingham Palace. I don't think the Queen was even there at the time. Maybe he just wanted to get into the palace. This parasocial relationship is very different to other types of parasocial relationships, however, because it's with a monarch and it's with an elderly woman. It's not the same as a large YouTuber and their subscribers or a K-pop band with their fangirls. I don't think Elizabeth ever gave anybody that emotion in which BTS fans feel when they look at Jimin. It was more so a universal feeling of respect, barring the people who weren't fans of the royal family full stop. However, throughout the years, Elizabeth has consistently been one of the most popular members of the royal family, if not the most popular one. If you asked the average everyday Briton what they thought of Queen Elizabeth, they would have said that she was respectable and they admired her. If you asked them what they thought of the royal family, they probably said that we don't need them and they didn't like them. There was this massive disconnect between the queen and her family, Elizabeth and the institution, her as a person and why she was in that position to begin with, aka exploitation of the working class, colonization. And I do think it has something to do with the time and the place in which she became queen. She was young, 25 years old. I'm 25. I haven't done half the things she's done. I mean, I, I don't have the money to do half the things she's done, but I probably wouldn't have the guts to do it. A lot of people think that being a monarch would be easy, but I don't know. I don't think I could handle having cameras following me everywhere and having such high expectations to behave perfectly at all times. It would probably cripple me. Along with the added fact that she was never initially raised with the intention of her to become queen. And I think that's what a lot of people admire about her. She was given a good 10 years and then suddenly, bam, you're the future queen of England, have fun. And then with the older generation, she was a teenager while they were a teenager also experiencing a world war. I think the disconnect comes with those events in mind. When the news of the Queen dying broke, many people's thoughts were, that's really sad, but now it's time to end the monarchy. They thought that she was a decent enough ruler that they would tolerate having her there, but after that, no, we've had enough. It's because she reigned for so long that people were so used to her, but also this growing knowledge of bringing up colonization and the impacts of it and how the British Empire was a detriment to many different countries definitely did change the idea of the monarchy as a whole. And because Elizabeth was so well liked, there wasn't really a push for her to abdicate or for the monarchy to be abolished at that point in time. Especially with the longevity of her reign, 70 years. It seems bizarre saying this, that we no longer have a queen. I'm weirded out by it. I kind of don't like it. It's new. It's weird. Undo it, please. But at the same time, I recognize the detriment that the British Empire was to many different other countries and having a monarchy is not the grandest thing. I mean, you are living off of my money that I worked for. I'd like that money back. Now, please. I think the idea of Elizabeth being a ruler was just something that we had accepted and we lived with, but we didn't really want the royal family anymore. She was the exception, and that's because she had many different attributes ascribed to her based on what I've already discussed. The length of her reign, the common experiences that she had with the older generation. But now things have changed, I feel like that has given us a switch. Awareness around the effects of post-colonization and anti-monarch sentiment didn't really hit Elizabeth because she was steadfast. She was a symbol of so many different things for so many different people and the public face of Britain for so long. Now that she's gone, I'm not really keen to carry it on. 
And the parasocial relationship still exists. We still respect, admire, and some even love her, even if we never met her. She didn't even know our names. And the point I'm really trying to get to is, Elizabeth wasn't really a person to us, she was a symbol. A symbol of reliability. A symbol of triumph after dark times. And that's why she was so loved. And it came as a shock to many people in Britain. Many people in different countries were like, what, she's like 94? Why are you surprised? Well, it, logically, it follows that she would die. She was very old. But it's such a disruption in normality. That's why it was a shock. It's like looking outside and seeing that rain is no longer rain, it's acid. And now that she's gone, I think the British public are more open to talking about no longer having a monarchy. The parasocial relationship with her, again, was what she symbolised, not what she was as a person. Again, we don't really know what she was like as a person. We get bits and pieces from personal anecdotes and things that she would say privately, but we're never going to get the full picture. And I don't even think it has anything to do with the likability of Charles. And we have the full picture of Charles. That's a story for another day. The Queen was a symbol and a representation of many different things. That's why we liked her. That's why we had her around. Now that she's not anymore, it's time for change. And I think as the years go on, we're going to be discussing more and more the relevance of the monarchy. And maybe in a hundred years time, there won't be one anymore. I hope you found this video interesting and informative. If you guys liked it, please subscribe and check out my Patreon, which is linked in the description, or you can become a member. Thank you so much, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.